have a victim of injustice. Uh, of, of grave, grave injustice, airline injustice of all things. And also he's won over $30 million in poker and has gone from sleeping on the floor of his friend's place apparently to... That's true, right? To, yeah, that's true. To uh, living the dream of sorts. Um, and uh, tournament and ex- also a tournament extraordinaire. What's up? Hello. What's up, Dan? So, do you want to talk about this uh, this Love Hansa incident? Um, yeah. There, there. This seems to That's be why I'm here. headline news. It must be of grave importance, and there's lots of rage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, two weeks ago, when I left to go to the Bahamas. I had my first, I, it wasn't the best itinerary, you know, I, I waited till the last second to book the travel. So I had to go from Dublin to Frankfurt, to Montreal, to the Bahamas. Not great, but that was the best I could do. That's ugly. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, when I got to Frankfurt, I realized, yeah. Oh yeah. I was go. you start by going in the wrong direction and then, yeah. Anyway, when I got to Frankfurt, I realized that my Canadian visa had expired and I needed the visa, even if I was just transferring in Canada, even if I wasn't like ever leaving the airport. So I wasn't able to board the flight to Montreal. So instead I booked another Lufthansa flight to Heathrow and then was gonna spend the night in Heathrow, take a flight to the Bahamas the next morning direct. Anyway, my bags got lost, or they didn't get lost. They didn't make it on my flight to Heathrow, and then they didn't make it on my flight to Nassau. But they told me, like, we're going to forward your bags. We have them. We're going to forward them ahead to Nassau. You'll get them very soon. And two weeks went by, and I never got them. Two weeks? Um, And two weeks, yeah. I was in the Bahamas for two weeks, and they never made it to the Bahamas. So after a few days of them lying to me that they were going to forward the bags, I started to get angry, started to tweet about it. And I was still in the main event of the PCA, uh, the 10K main event, not the PSPC. And I was on, got moved to the TV table on day three. And I was like, here's my chance. Like, you know, they haven't done anything in four days. Time to get angry. So uh, in the middle of defending my big blind, I uh, just started shouting, like, never fly Lufthansa. They're a bunch of thieves, a bunch of liars, you know, just boycott Lufthansa. And I thought maybe that would be enough to get their attention, but still things kept continuing on. Ne- never got any you know, phone calls from them or emails. They just kept ignoring me. My bags had an air tag in them, so I knew that they were at Heathrow and they just never forwarded them to me. And then after a bit of time, um, I uh, got in contact with someone from CNN and they wanted to write a story about it. And um, I figured, okay, well, if CNN is going to write a story about this, surely now someone from Lufthansa is going to do something about it. And a Lufthansa spokesperson is quoted in the article as saying, like, we're going to reach out to Steve. We're going to work through this. We're going to make sure he gets his bags back. And three days later, I still had no, after the, app, the CNN article was published, three days go by, still no contact from them. And as I was getting uh, on my flight in the Bahamas to fly back, I got a message from an Irish guy who works at Lufthansa, or not works, he works at Heathrow, not with Lufthansa, but he works at Heathrow for a baggage repatriation company Yeah, who does some contract work with Lufthansa. And he was like, I saw your story on CNN. I'm a fellow Irish lad. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and he was like, uh, I saw your story and this is unacceptable. This is insane. Um, I was able to pull your file out of the Lufthansa system. And that's how I got your email address. He was like, I'm going to be back at work at Heathrow tomorrow, uh, and I'm going to personally find your bags. That's and by so the time funny. I arrived back in Ireland yesterday, he was like, I found your bags. I've got them. I'm going to put them on a flight to you. <laughs> and I got the bags back yesterday. But it had nothing at all to do with Lufthansa. It was just that some guy, some Irish guy, saw my story on CNN and was like, I can fix this. That's so crazy. And that you're... he fixed it himself. <laughs> like, some guy just, like, was like felt sorry for you yeah, just... like dude dude this is like some wild injustice and he's like uh he's mm-hmm. like uh ratting out left hands he's like left hands is full of shit steve i got you though 
I feel your pain. I'm getting yeah. your bag for you. Yeah, he was he was just as angry as I was. He was like, this is shameful. Like, he was really mad when I talked to him on the phone. He was like, I can't believe this happened. Um, and, yeah, he just felt bad and got the bags. And they were back to, to me within hours. Well, well um, I guess so. justice prevailed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, they still owe me a lot of money. Like, I oh, need really? to get paid back by them. That's going to be the next issue is that, you know, I had to spend a lot of money at Baja Mar for me and uh, Elizabeth, uh, my, my girlfriend. Like, we had to we had to spend a lot of money. Baja Mar is not cheap. Um, and we had nothing with us for two weeks. So um, it seems like it's not easy to get paid back by Lufthansa either from what I'm reading online. So, I mean, um, yeah, I just don't ever fly Lufthansa. Don't do it. They're thieves. And uh, if anything ever goes wrong, they're not going to want to help you. They're not going to do anything at all. You're just going to have to find some friendly guy who uh, <laughs> can help you on his own. You have to consult the world to get back your bags. You have to uh, some some guy with a good heart mm -hmm. for the good-hearted Irish folks. Yep. Might, there might be a, like a bard somewhere that'll help you. <laughs> It'll sing a song about La Panza. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's kind of a crazy story, actually. Yeah. My first thought, uh, as you were telling it, was something like, well, I don't know if they're really lying. They, like, think they can get it and there's some other problems or whatever. But it is really telling that this guy just, like, found your bag for you. And, like, all of Lufthansa couldn't do it, even after yeah. the spokesperson was like, oh, we're going to find your bag, Steve. We got you, man. <laughs> even the guy just, like, I'm going to take whatever yeah. he did. And he's, like, and he somehow found it. It's, like, actually a crazy uh, yeah, I only got it back because some guy that has nothing to do with Lufthansa was able to get it back to me. I would think, yeah, the whole of Lufthansa would be a bit more competent. Um, what can I say, though? It definitely looks like total incompetence. I would have thought so, too. But Yeah. Well, I'm glad that uh, something... Um, I'm glad that justice can be served on the site. I'm a big proponent of justice. Uh, yeah, I am too. You just gotta, you gotta be on the side of justice. And I felt like I was wronged, so, you know, yeah. I had to chase down justice. I, I, I personally not call them thieves myself. Uh, my personal view is just wild incompetency. It definitely looks like that. And obviously they should return you the money. And I think uh, that's just my personal take. Um, and well, I mean... Based on my research, it seems like other people, based on my research, it seems like uh, the experience of other people trying to get refunds from them is that they ignore you for as long as possible, like up to a year, and then hope you just give up uh, so they don't have to refund you for anything. And then, uh, you know, the people that are still fighting them a year later, those people eventually get paid. But it seems like uh, they just try to ignore any requests for refunds for as long as possible. Um, and then they refund you. So that's kind of like being thieves in my opinion. No, I agree. Actually, uh, that is, that is a situation where greed is taking over. Yeah. If that's the case, like a one year is like the, it seems very insane. Uh, yeah, just in my, my, my interpretation of most people who steals that they're stealing out of, uh, not, um, not like consciously aware that their result they, they make in unconscious mistakes so they make mistakes in somewhere else and it results in them stealing uh mm -hmm. in ways like uh you know people well, this isn't first. this isn't really an individual this is uh yeah this is one of the biggest airlines in the world so they're not they're not making unconscious decisions they're they're actively thieving that does appear to be in my opinion okay uh Okay, I, uh, I'll, you know, I can, uh, I mostly agree with you, at least. I, <laughs> no, I mean, it definitely looks not right. good. Uh, and Lufthansa, take that! <laughs> um, yeah, sounds like a, like a big, uh, you know, the more powerful the organization, the greater the responsibility, as Spider-Man says. And Lufthansa is shirking innocent Exactly. Irish men like Steve O'Dwyer and presumably it sounds like a lot of other people so damn them a little bit it is make some money which is the 
Yeah, no, damn them a lot. Let's let's not let's not hold back, Jungle. All right, damn them a lot. All right, damn them, damn them a lot. Uh, a lot of money or whatever. Great. Um, but no plane crashes. I don't think. I don't think we're don't don't damn them that much. Um, no, no, of course not. No, no, let's not damn them go that much. Uh, I want to also talk about some other sorts of what about other kinds of justice. Uh, po- poker justice, as a matter of fact, uh, because yeah, I, I poker justice. I've read that you started out and you had quite a lot of struggles when you started out um, when you played poker. Like it wasn't just smooth sailing for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I started playing in 2004. And really, for the first several years, I didn't have that much success. Like, I was grinding extremely hard and barely making ends meet. Um, But also at the same time, like, you know, by 2007, like, I had a lot of people that wanted to stake me for higher stakes that I couldn't play on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, So even though I pretty quickly, you know, within a few years was playing big buy-in tournaments. Uh, Personally, I wasn't doing so well. I was barely making ends meet. Um, And then when Black Friday happened, I was, you know, devastated because the little bit of of bankroll that I did have got stuck on full tilt. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was living on Scott Seaver's floor for the entire summer after Black Friday. well, that's pretty crazy. And yeah, I'm just like borrowing money, just borrowing money to be able to eat and then just uh, playing tournaments because I was really deep in makeup back then. I had like 400,000 in makeup at that point when Black Friday happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was I was in bad shape. I had no money of my own and 400,000 in makeup to work through. Uh, so they were just like loaning me money for food. Um and I was sleeping on an air mattress in Scott's floor at Panorama. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just wanted to keep playing turns. I mean, I had been grinding like a lot of cash games, both six max and heads up for, at like, you know, oh, okay. I was playing like one, two, six max and two, two, four heads up. You know, I played a few million hands of cash games on my own money. Yeah. Before Black Friday. And then also was playing tournaments, like getting stake for higher stakes tournaments. Uh, okay. Um, well, but when Black Friday happened, I figured cash games were going to probably be a lot worse, and tournaments were still going to be great. So I just decided to, at that point to focus on tournaments, and I thought the best tournaments at that point would be in Europe for the next few years. So I was just entirely focused on grinding European tournaments, and also making my first trips out to Macau at the same time for their tournaments. And that's kind of when things turned around for me. Uh, I, I mean, my confidence was always very high. Um, because of, you know, the fact that, you know, Scott Siever and Ike Haxton, uh, were willing to back me in tournaments. Uh, so, you know, they were always, you know, very supportive of me, even though I was personally doing quite poorly. Um, yeah, that must so have yeah been. I just went out to Europe and just started playing everything I could. And then things kind of turned around from there. That is a pretty big vote of confidence. You know, I was making a little bit of money in cash games on my own, uh, but that was just going towards like living expenses. Mm-hmm. And then I was just getting destroyed in tournaments. Uh, so it, uh, it definitely makes things difficult, but I just wasn't ever willing to give up. Um, and then I got to Europe and then things kind of turned around. The games were really good over here and, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, within a few years, I was completely on my own, you know, still selling action for like, you know, 25 K's and up, but otherwise, you know, I had my, all my own action and everything else, um, mm-hmm. pretty quickly after making it to Europe. Yeah. I think uh, poker really teaches ten- tenacity. Uh, because to make a living at tournaments, you have to get used to losing really a lot. Like, you know, unless you cash in like the top five percent, which is, you know, very hard percentile to reach in anything, you're not really going to make any money. 
you're going to be a loser at tournaments if you can't hit that, like, you know, the top few places, the final table kind of situations, basically. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you're just losing a lot and then hoping every once in a while you win big enough to, uh, put yourself decently ahead. That's kind of the irony because, like, everyone chases the tournaments for, you know, the dream of winning, but it's actually, like, the hard way to make money, uh, at least in this kind of way. Yeah, but, it's it's not easy, but... And then uh, cash games. But I, I love it. I, I There's nothing more exciting. Not even, like, just nothing in the world I can imagine that's more exciting than being deep in a big tournament. Like, it's just such a great feeling. Um, what do you like so much about it? Like, you know, and especially if you're in like, in like a main event type situation where you're playing against a lot of people that are just like playing way higher stakes than they've ever played before. And they're just terrified of you. Like, it's so much fun. Just like torturing them. <laughs> so you're, it's the best that. feeling. Uh, so you like to inflict a little bit of pain, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, it's it's fun. Um, <laughs> you get to play some very fun poker hands at that point. Um, that yeah, I can definitely see that. If people people act very erratically when emotions are very high, they tend to revert to their original nature. I would say. Um, mm. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, either they start doing some some wild things, ill-advised things, um, or they are just like terrified that they're doing you know anything that could cause them to bust out of the tournament, and that causes them to play like you know four percent of hands. Um, that allows you, as the person they're scared of, to kind of do whatever you want and get away with murder. It's it's very fun. Um, last year I won the Irish Open, which is a one thousand euro buy-in tournament that had two thousand entries, mm -hmm. and I kind of got a hold of the big chip lead with about fourteen players left. And from that point on in the tournament, I was like eighty percent fee pip, uh, <laughs> and you know, with like eight left, I was frequently all in blind, like. There's the chip distribution was like incredibly in my favor where like everybody was bunched together with like 10 big blinds each. And I had like 190 at one point when like no one else had more than 12. Uh, and they were just like desperate to get second place. And I just like couldn't lose. I could just go all in dark every hand and win almost every hand. It was, uh, that was fun. That does sound like the dream situation. I guess that's like the dream, the dream, uh, dream opportunity. I guess you could say is just being able to mow down the competition. It's hard to get in that precise situation. Um, mm. I could see it really happening in the main event. Yeah, I mean, I've it's the only time I've ever experienced it. Like even live or online, I've never had a chip lead like that with so few players left in such a giant field. So that the pay jumps were still really big, like, um, yeah, it was fun. It's it's really just like the journey of a tournament from start to finish is what I enjoy. Like you know, playing a tournament that lasts four, five, six days, and building that journey up to the point where you're at the final table and getting to play for higher stakes than uh, way higher stakes than what you started at, you know, a few days earlier. That's that's what's fun, you know. Just trying to, to play mistake free for so many days in a row, mm -hmm. um, while also you know getting lucky to make it to that point. Like you know, you always have to have some luck to to still be in the tournament after several days. But um, yeah, it's just putting together that start to finish run is something I, I really enjoy. Yeah, the journey of the tournament. Uh, that. I can see how that makes sense. I'm trying to think if, like, I, myself playing tournaments, if I could find a way to appreciate that. Um, I mean, in the beginning, it really is like a cash game in my experience. Would you yeah. say that? 
Yeah, I mean, people treat it like a cash game, too. They don't really care to bust, usually. Um, mm -hmm. And then it evolves into... It evolves into a situation where people are a lot more suspicious, uh, you could say. Um, mm -hmm. Or a lot more careful. Careful. Um, yeah. As you were saying it, actually, I was thinking to myself um, various analogies of, like... I don't know if you could see this or not, but like almost like how evolution works or like the growth from um, like mm, there's there's some relation, I guess, more like growing up. Uh, there can be a bit of uh, that situation going on, but it, it seems like that that analogy doesn't work that well. Um, but uh, I can see it a little bit, though, you know. There's there's a there's an evolutionary process of tournaments where like you start out, you start out with a little embryo chip stack, and then as time time grows, all of a sudden you have like a, you know, a big, big thing. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, also kids tend to be very reckless when they're young, and then like as they grow older, they're like, oh shit, uh, you know, you have to like, yeah, protect your stack and, um like now you're like very conscientious of things and there's various points in a tournament where the um, there's the risk the risk payoffs of what you do change a lot like when you're on the bubble um ice dam really matters a lot which means mm. that you have to um react accordingly to uh like what the pay jumps actually are i mean there's Various analogies in real life, like when you're running businesses, for example, you can afford to be very risky in the beginning, but at some point you need to um, curtail that risk depending on like what stage you are in the tournament and what like, or excuse me, what stage you are in like the business development. Um, I mean, perhaps, I don't know anything about running businesses. Okay. So. I'm getting too wild here. Um, I, I'm so, not a businessman. So how does like uh, well you're known really well for your hero calls, um, how does that come into play later into tournaments and um, yeah are you really good at figuring out is it, is it because you're really good at figuring out what people are going through emotionally through these various stages of the tournaments? Uh, or... I think yeah I think so I mean I I don't know I, I feel like I have some pretty good reads on people and I try to really pay attention to like, you know, where people are emotionally at different points in the tournament. Um, it doesn't matter so much at like the higher stakes when I'm playing against people that, you know, are the best in the world because everybody's really good at, you know, hiding their tells and looking out for things. And But like when um, you're playing against weaker opponents, I feel like I'm oh, yeah. very observant about you know, what people's emotions are at different points in the tournament and then kind of adjusting based on, you know, what I'm picking up off them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess uh, some people think uh, I'm known for my hero calls. I guess I've made a few big ones that uh, people like to, to point out, um, especially the, there was the one uh, at the PCA 100K final table when I was heads up. Um, I was recently in Japan playing some very low stakes tournaments at a poker tour that my friend uh, runs in Osaka. Mm -hmm. And basically every Japanese person there wanted to talk about that hand. They, uh, they, they loved it, even though it happened, you know, eight years ago or seven years ago. They were all just like so excited to ask me about my big heads up hero call with Ace-10. Um, so yeah, I mean... I'm just, uh, and, and sometimes it backfires because, like, I, I feel like sometimes uh, I get a little too too confident in my uh, ability to make the big call, and all of a sudden I'm calling with some garbage against someone who just only has the nuts, and I feel very stupid. I've um, done that one. I, I'm I'm very guilty of yeah. that one, uh, quite a lot. But uh, it's so fun when you're right. It's great. No better feeling, you know. And also, they'll talk about it for eight more years, if yeah. you're right. Yeah. That's that's nice. But so there's, sometimes, you sometimes you do it when no one's watching, 
no one will ever read about it. And the only people that will ever remember it are the people that were at the table, you know, so. Uh, Guess what? Guess what, Steve? Of... Now's your time. Now is your time to talk about it. Yeah. Tell us about the hero calls that no one, no one witnessed. The hero calls that never existed, according to the poker world. Um, but that I do. Well, it'd be hard for me to because I, I feel like my memory over the years has gotten much worse for being able to recall things that happened. I mean, I'm 40 years old now. Your, your memory really starts to fade, um, and I'm not too good at like pulling pulling those memories out. Um, it all just like poker just becomes a blur to me. Uh, unless it's something like especially memorable where there's like big laughs involved. I, I don't know if I'm too good at, uh, off the cuff pulling out, uh, some great story from a poker hand. Sorry. Well, are there, are there any hero calls you made relatively recently that you, uh, can share with the stream? I mean, if you're, um, if you're trying to protect people from embarrassment, uh, um, then, I don't know. I, I mean, PCA, like, you know, I played a lot of poker over the last two weeks and I didn't have much success. Um, I, 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 sit, I got, ended up breaking even cause I got fourth in the hundred K the, on the last day. Um, but that tournament that I didn't have any hero calls in that one. It was just kind of, I won some, some all wins and all of a sudden, uh, I was at the final table, but um, I don't know. Recent hero calls. It could be a bluff. It doesn't have to be a hero. Yeah, call. bluffs. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I'm always trying some bluffs, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm really letting you down here, but my, uh, like I said, well, I'm not trying to be. Uh, secretive here huh? i just i'm not trying to be secretive i'm just not recalling anything uh particularly okay. interesting well uh maybe maybe that will change in the future i've got one myself but i have to ask the question now if a poker player makes a big hero call and no one sees it did it really happen so oh this... for sure because you can always tell people about it or our people that were at the table will be like oh my god did you see that hero call or have you heard about that hero call that Jungle Man made the other day? Oh my God. You know, word gets around, that's for sure. Even if there's no poker news there to report it or no TV cameras. You know. I guess I'll have to hear the, the stories of the Steve O'Dwyer hero calls through the grapevines and yeah. I'll have to, like, um, I'll have to go into the streets and find them. Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't nickname me the sheriff uh, for, for no reason. I mean, it's it, that the nickname hasn't really oh. caught on publicly. But uh, like all the, the super high roller players, they all call me Sheriff. Um, Sheriff and have been for, for several years. <laughs> I've got one hand um, where I didn't hear a call, but I, but I bluffed on national TV and no one saw it. I like Checkman Ray's bluffed um, Chris Moneymaker on the river. And it was on uh, national, it was on this, uh, what is it called? The MBS Heads Up. Mm -hmm. uh, thing, whereas range was like super polar, and they didn't catch it. I'm so mad. Yeah, that um, that's always really upsetting when you when you're like, wow, I played this great hand on TV. This is gonna be, uh, this is gonna make me look great, and then it doesn't make the broadcast. And you're like, guys, who's editing these shows? This was, this was a beautiful hand of poker, and instead you showed, you know, some some boring kings versus tens all in. You know, for 12 big blinds. I should have done what you did about the pans and started yelling, like, I made a crazy Roko. What? Like, where's the justice? I did I did do that one time, like, nine years ago or something with uh, Poker Stars. Uh, I think it was, like, it was uh, EPT London. And they, you know, a few days later, like, um, I was like, oh, I'm going to go back and watch the stream. And they, for some reason, they only uploaded the final table stream because they had been broadcasting the live stream on YouTube for days. But then, mm -hmm. like, f for, like, archival footage, they only had uploaded the final table. And yeah. I yelled at them. I was like, why haven't you uploaded, you know, all the other days? Because there was this beautiful hand that took place on, on day four or day five. 
that that made me look like a genius. And uh, you guys, uh, there's no way to access that anymore. I want to I want to have this, you know, archived for history. And they were like, OK, just this one time we'll upload upload those to, uh, you know, PokerStars.tv. Um, but I, I mean, it was such a long time ago. I don't remember what the hand was. I just remember e tracking down the email of the person in charge of the archival footage and demanding they upload it. Maybe I should do the same thing. Maybe I should just like retroactively say, no, this hand actually happened. Yeah, you need to um, re-edit the show and uh, rebroadcast it with, with footage that makes me look better. All right. So something like that in the moment seems like a decent time. Decent, Not not that bad of a thing to... I mean, maybe it could be worked. I guess there's like some strategy and PR that makes sense. Yeah, you Otherwise, always want to look good. Something like that. Well, you gotta look bad a little bit sometimes, so that yeah. If you're not if you're not looking bad frequently, you're doing something wrong. Like you have to be, you have to be doing stuff that makes you look really dumb sometimes, or else you're not trying hard enough. Well, see that gets you attention too. Like um, it's polarizing. It's like some people say, "Oh, like Steve O'Dwyer's a genius," or they might say, um, "Or whatever." I'm I'm yeah. a little bit. I'm mostly at peace with all that. I, yeah. Uh, I, I love idiots. hearing that people think I'm an idiot. Uh, it's it's very motivating. <laughs> There's, I mean, I remember exactly who was berating me at you know, the three dollar rebuy on Poker Stars in two thousand and five. Like, I, I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna publicly say their name, but I, I remember, and the twenty dollar UB tournament on two thousand two thousand four. I think, believe another guy yeah. that's still around. He was berating me. And I, I've never forgotten. Like I love hearing people talk shit, bad mouthing me either to my face or behind my back. Because all that motivation uh, has really paid off over the years. That seems like a really great uh, skill set. Uh, not skill set. Thing to appreciate is the the people bad mouthing you. Yeah. Um, now I'm confused. Like if you make a big hero call against me. What if now I badmouth you because I know that you'll remember me then and you'll remember the hero call. <laughs> so you'll remember, oh yeah, <laughs> Jungle Man did this for me. He was talking shit for, for me. Yeah, so I, I mean, can... if, if, I, if that happens, if you, if you get really mad at me at some point and start trashing me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to pull all the Jungle Man footage I can and study you as deeply as possible so that anytime we play together in the future... I'm prepared to to destroy you. So. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh shit. Well, I don't know if I want to help you out then. Now, now I'll just be like, "All right, good call, man." Yeah. Just, good just job. be I'm still okay. Just be friendly. <laughs> you don't want to be uh, getting on my uh, spiteful side. All right. So that's a that's a word out to all you poker players out there. Um, if you're gonna badmouth Steve O'Dwyer, uh, just so you know that. That uh, Irish wrath is coming right back at you. You're gonna be yeah, don't... a massive target. It'll like put up a uh, a. Uh, I should actually do that. Um, is put. You know, I thought to do that. That's great. That's a great idea. Is put like a massive like picture of someone's face and just like mm -hmm. throw darts at it. Um, or I mean, you don't have to throw darts at it. Just just keep a picture of their face. At, at home so that you see it and you it reminds you like I need to work harder so that the next time I play this guy I destroy him all right well um, do you have any nemesis I guess yeah that's one way to deal with them is just uh, it's, uh, you make a list of nemesis yeah you make I a just, big girl call against me huh? it's up here it's it's up here I have a list of all the people that I know have ever uh, bad mouthed me. And, you know, I, I work through it. I get my, my revenge anytime I can. I already have a list of all the people who have ever made big hero dolls against me. Fortunately, or unfortunately, you're not on that list. <laughs> yeah, I've never, I mean, we've played a little bit together, but uh, you don't play enough tournaments these days. I mean, I remember you had a period where you were playing a lot of online tournaments and we played together quite a bit. You know, I'd say maybe yeah. like eight eight years ago, you were playing a lot of tournaments online. I played some tournaments. I'll be playing more in the future. I believe we played in Morocco together. We did. Do you remember that? Yes. 
That was that was that was when we first spoke. I could never forget that trip. Why could you never forget that trip? Well, I mean, uh, you, you had your your own travel issues, so to speak. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Getting <laughs> you ended up in the middle of a civil war. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> yeah, thankfully. Um, but yeah, that's that. That was a crazy story. Um, I remember. Uh, I remember a couple things I did that trip. I don't mm-hmm. remember. We played against each other. I remember you saying you like read people well in poker. Mm-hmm. I remember I played a song when I was all in. Um, maybe I can do this more in the future, actually, because there's I have some like really epic and over the top music. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not win the all in, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I did that and. That got some reactions. And also, did you manage to go outside of the resort? Because we didn't really go to Morocco. We went to fake Morocco. Yeah. We went we... to this resort, Mazagan Resort. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, like, the, it's not near the actual city. Or it's not in the actual city. Did you go outside? No. I mean, the weather was really bad when we were there. I don't, we were there in November. The weather was cold and rainy. And I left as soon as I busted because I lost a pot for like 20% of the chips in play with like 40 people left like I lost like a really really big pot uh to bust out um uh, yeah and I was just like I gotta get out of here as soon as possible I'm so tilted there was no side events to play and I just wanted to leave as as fast as possible so that does um, sound very I was only there for like three nights um but I remember when I got to that resort, I was like, this place, it feels like Atlantis, but with like a North African motif instead of like a Caribbean motif. Like, and then I, I, I asked, like, I started asking around and someone was like, yeah, this place was designed by the same person that designed Atlantis, by the same architect. Ooh. And so I, was, I felt, I felt good about, uh, you know, the feeling I had of, you know, like, why does this feel exactly like Atlantis? Um, well, I got a good reason for why it might just feel exactly like Atlantis. But uh, first, let me tell you a story about what made me want to get the hell out of there also. <laughs> I I uh, decided that I wanted to see the real Morocco. Mm-hmm. And I was sick of this resort shit. I didn't come to st- to go to have a layover in Libya and travel, <laughs> like, what, 20-plus hours to get to Morocco. You go to a f***ing resort... No, no, no. I wanted to see the real Morocco. So the first thing I did was I took a taxi and traveled around Casablanca and went to that Mm. famous mosque. So there's that. That was whatever. And then I decided, and I think I even asked you and other people if they wanted to come with me. I decided, I want to go to Marrakesh, Mm -hmm. the the capital city of Morocco. And uh, no one wanted to come, so I went by myself. And when I got there, it was like the the only time I ever felt homesick ever. It was just that um crazy of a place where it was like straight up aladdin there was like you know elephants in the streets and Mm. uh the streets were barely developed and monkeys playing with kids and people like trying to haggle me constantly and trying to sell me shit and like screw me over for money it's like in the culture there's like minarets and it's like straight up like yeah it was like that and i'm just like what am i doing here i don't know anyone here and this place is dirty and whatever but apparently it's just become much more developed now. Uh, I could only stay there for a couple of days, and then it was it was just too much. It was too, and I was just too much in the wild. Yeah, um, I, I'd love to go back, but I had my own problems leaving Morocco because I got pulled aside by a customs officer when I was going mm-hmm. through immigration, and he was like, you know, and you know, it's like the standard customs thing where they start interrogating you about like. You know, what have you been up to here? What, What's going on? Why are you here? Where are you going? And uh, I was like, yeah, I was playing a poker tournament here. Um, and the guy's like, oh, poker. Like, I play poker. And I was like, oh, uh, cool. And he was like, yeah, I play online. I play like, you know, $5 tournaments, $10 tournaments. And he was like, what, what was the tournament you're playing? I was like, oh, it was a 3K buy-in WPT. And he was like, well, how did it go? And I was like, well, you know, it, I started, you know, telling him the hand history of how I busted out for 20% of the chips in play with 40 left. 
And he got really upset. And he was like, no, like, what are you doing? Like, you, you have to <laughs> fold there. That's, that's unbelievable. Like, <laughs> and he just sits me down. Like, I'm in his office. It's like the head of customs it's at like the airport to, like, in, in Marrakesh. And he's really upset at me. And he's like, okay, will you come back? Is there going to be another tournament in Morocco? I was like, yeah, maybe. Like, I might come back again. He's like, okay. Uh, you must take my phone number. When you come back, you will stake me for the tournament. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> He's like, yes, like, here's my phone okay. number. And he made, me, he made me pull out my phone and he watched me put his phone number in my phone and like made me do like a, like a test call to make sure I had the, the phone correct. And he was like, when you come back for the next tournament in Morocco, you're, you will stake me. I was like, uh, <laughs> okay, man. And I've, I've never been back to Morocco for poker because I'm afraid that this guy, like, you know, he had all my personal information. He had my passport. I'm sure he, he wrote it down, like, uh, and, you know, maybe he's followed my poker career. And if he sees me come back, he's like, he might remember this promise I made that I would, I would stake him. Because I was like, I was willing to agree to anything. I was like, get me out of this guy's office. He's kind of scaring me. Um, so hopefully if I ever go back to Morocco for a tournament, I can avoid this guy. Cause he's gonna, he's gonna want to buy in. They do have a weird cultural culture of haggling. They're very, very pushy. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was going outside of Marrakesh, there's this dude selling me this like crystal rock and he's broke. And uh, I told him, no, I, I went outside, we were in a bus and I went outside and, uh, we're, I'm looking around or whatever. And I told him, no. And then like, I go back in the bus and he like knocks on the window and like holds up the rock. I'm like, come on, man. Like, uh, and um, I've also heard a story, I think from Tom Dwan, of them being on, him being on some kind of airplane, uh, private airplane, and uh, going to the toilet and uh, there being no toilet paper. And one of the crew members coming in uh, in Morocco and like showing some toilet paper and like asking for a little money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I would be, I would be upset if someone did that to me. Uh, that's not right. Yeah. I'm not supposed to be, by the way, it's a, um, a bit of a uh, low frequency uh, play of sorts, but I'm not supposed to be cursing on this podcast. Okay. And, but in this case, it seems warranted. Don't Steve got that Irish rage. Apparently, um, the Irish gangsters, by the way, are the most dangerous gangsters. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I mean, I, I hear some stories. Um, yeah, uh, there's a uh, there's some gangs. I'll leave it yeah. at that. There, there are gangs out there. Um, so you, uh. Going back to this Irish Open tournament, mm -hmm. um, I understand it was one of the most emotional wins for you. Was it just because you were able to uh, really exploit your competition, or what was it? No, I mean, um, first off, like the Irish Open is the second oldest poker tournament in the world behind the World Series main event. Like the Irish Open's been going on for forty years, so just like the history of the event that it's been, you know, been around for as long as any other poker tournament except for the main event um, or mm -hmm. been around longer than any tournament except for the main event is special. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of poker history. I really appreciate, you know, the, yeah. the stories of the people that came before us and uh, the people who built up the game to the point where we get to play it uh, at such high stakes all around the world. Um, really? Yeah. So, the for just just on its own, the history of winning a tournament that that's old that is that old is, is special. Um, and then also, you know, I have an Irish passport. I live in Ireland, and uh, I've played the tournament many times before. And uh, I've never I never prior to that won a live tournament with that many entries. You know, beating a field of two thousand players in a live tournament's really difficult. And, that is uh, very difficult. That's very hard. So yeah, um, all those things combined. Uh, yeah, really. And plus, like, I hadn't played any, uh, I hadn't played any poker for six months up until the point I registered for that tournament. I had taken the longest break I'd ever had. I just hadn't played any live or online for six months. And then the first thing I enter after that 
very long break, I ended up winning. So, um, yeah, all those things combined, I was pretty emotional after winning that tournament. I didn't, I didn't cry, but I was, I was getting quite, a, quite choked up. Well, yeah, something has to mean something. It, it, yeah, there should be things that mean something to you, even in the, the sea of variance and mm. the old rationality of the poker decks. Mm. Um, it's important to find meaning in these kinds of things. So um, related to that, I understand you're like traveling around all the time. What made you pick Ireland to move into? Well, I mean, I have an Irish citizenship and uh, I really like it here. It's beautiful country, friendly people. It's convenient for me to travel to like the places that I go to to play tournaments. Um, it's kind of centrally located for the most part. And uh, yeah, I just, I just really like it here. It's, and it's good. Like most people say like, oh, Ireland doesn't have good weather. In my opinion, Ireland's got great weather. It never gets too hot. It never gets too cold. You're always kind of like right in the middle, you know, the win the winters are quite mild and the summers are very mild as well. And, uh, I, I just don't like to be very hot or very cold. And, uh, Ireland's right there in the middle. Um, hmm. just mild year round. Um, I keep hearing all these good things about Ireland. I'm getting curious myself. Yeah. Have you, you've never been? Uh, no, I haven't. You should come visit. I've been to London a lot. Yeah. It's, it's better than London. London really? is uh, too big, too crowded, very rude people, in my opinion. Um, Ireland's much better. I mean, it's it's very small compared to to London uh, here in Dublin, but uh, it's quaint. Is how I would describe it. Quaint. It's very quaint. I, well, I do like things that are uh, quirky. I think quirky yeah. and quaint close together. Yeah. I think you'd um, enjoy it. At some point, I think I'll come. Uh, there's also like some kind of mystical element related to um, Ireland, I understand, or at least the UK, that's a bit mysterious to me. I've become more interested in these um, global global mysticism, mystic practices, the practices mm. of sorts like the ancient Druids that uh, lived in Ireland because I have this theory that... Um, I have this theory that it, it looks like all these practices kind of align, which mm -hmm. is a little bit um, spooky. It's like not something that can be coincidental, um, at least in other parts of the world. And I've been interested in that. And by the way, I forgot to tell you about this Atlantis thing is that actually people are hypothesizing now that Atlantis was in um, North, uh, what, like North uh, Western Africa. There's quite yes. a lot of evidence. The, the, the recat structure. In, in Mauritania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I, I am very aware of these, uh, these uh, theories. I, I, love, I love reading about that stuff. All right, good, because the audience loves this stuff too. Do you have anything, anything uh, do you want to say about your beliefs about Atlantis and other sorts of uh, uh, um, mythical? Yeah, I mean, I'm not stuff? sold on that theory, uh, but I, I'm aware of it. I think it's very interesting. Um, and I wish that the political situation in that part of the world allowed for more archaeological uh, exploration. But um, it seems like uh, Mauritania does not quite allow for uh, the archaeologists to get in there and, and study the recat structure as much as they would like. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at the satellite photos of that area, it, it and compared to the writings of, uh, I believe it was Plato, who is the one who wrote about um, yeah, Plato. the existence of Atlantis. And uh, it's intriguing. I'll, I'll say that much. I, I'm, not, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not a historian. I'm just a guy who's interested in this stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, it's fun to think about. It might, <laughs> it might amount to nothing, but uh, it's fun to imagine that Atlantis was... Uh, was in North Africa during the time period when the Sahara was uh, green and lush. Um, so I've gone down this rabbit hole a little bit myself uh, mm -hmm. with some kind of practical reason. To be precise, um, the subject of Atlantis I didn't dig too deeply in, but it was more like to verify something that 
another spiritual person was saying. Because like once a spiritual person says something that doesn't make any sense, now I have to question everything else they say. Yeah. Um, I'm actually quite critical of people that say spiritual things, um, even though I may not appear that way. Um, it seemed like a lot of the evidence lined up pretty well with it existing. I just, um, it was a, it was a subject, it was one that's a lot more, it was one of these ancient civilizations that was a lot more questionable that I really questioned, uh, called Lemuria. If you've ever heard of that? Uh, it sounds familiar, but I can't remember where they were supposed to be located. Well, allegedly, you know, there's the, they're now, they have now reloaded, relocated to this weird mountain called Mount Shasta, which is in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I understood that you could actually uh, communicate with them. And I was like, okay, well, prove it. Uh, yeah, I would like to see if that's real or not. Um, and basically, I don't know how much these facts are lining up. Uh, let's put it that way. But I will say that Mount Shasta is a really weird place. Mm -hmm. And Atlantis actually does seem... There's quite some evidence of ancient civilizations existing in some kind of way. I just... It's really hard to fact check all these things. Uh, Atlantis actually does seem like it has quite a bit of evidence, uh, if particularly it's there um, mm -hmm. in northern Africa. There's also strange things like apparently alongside the coast of the U.S. There's like a lot of like evidence, or at least there was a lot of evidence of um, ancient advanced civilizations that no one knew anything about, which is very strange. Um, I read this in pretty random book i wasn't even trying to find it yeah i mean i think people are starting to find out that uh our ancestors were quite a bit more advanced than we believed they were um and i think it's i don't know how much you've seen of this like new uh radar technology that they're using to uh like penetrate like you send drones up with this new radar technology and it penetrates the canopies of forests and they're finding like these enormous cities that were just kind of eaten by the forests or the jungles in all really? over the world. But really a, a lot of it um, is being uncovered in like Central America and uh, mm. the or northern part America. of South America, like all over like, uh, you know, Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua. Guatemala. Yeah. All these <laughs> places that they're, all right, all right. they're using this new, technology to kind of uh, look beneath the trees and the hills to uncover old civilizations that were swallowed, you know, after they died out. And we're finding that there was a lot more, a uh, lot more people doing uh, some pretty heavy building that we didn't know about. Steve, I have news for you uh, that you may not have known, but in about well, uh, a week or so. Mm -hmm. I'm going on a mystic quest to Guatemala. Nice. So Enjoy. if you give me information about where these places might be, that won't result in my legs being cut up by some bear trap or something, please. Uh, I will probably, I might just be able to check out these, these mystic ruins. I mean, that yeah, sounds like know. something. Just, a job for a jungle man. Just, just Google Guatemala archaeology, and I'm sure you'll get some... Uh new results on things that they're uncovering out there in the jungles. Ooh, shit. Well, I better live up to my name. I gotta go to the yeah. jungles. Yeah, you gotta be the jungle man. Well, yeah, I'm basically becoming the jungle man, in case you didn't notice, by the way. It's, 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 a, it's a work in progress. Uh, but now I'm all excited because all this mystic stuff. Maybe I can, like, verify something. Maybe I could see some crazy shit. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Guatemala seems like... Uh, I mean, like, what if, like, something happens? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm into it. Yeah, maybe um, you'll, you'll make the archaeological, archaeological find of the century. Imagine that. <laughs> I gotta get my Indiana Jones outfit. Oh, I, that's the most obvious thing. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta get the hat. <laughs> um... Uh, you gave me an idea, actually. You gave me an idea. Oh, my God. All right, all right. Um, thank you. Thank You're welcome. you. Uh, there's a very real chance this happens, by the way. I'm not even kidding. No, I, I <laughs> hope it does. I love I love when you get dressed up. All right, all right. Well, I'm about to do it again. Um, 
Why don't you, uh, well, it appears you're, you have some superstitions. I don't know if my information's exactly right, but you've got some lucky and unlucky objects of sorts. I don't know have. if I have unlucky objects, but yeah, uh, I've got a lot of lucky objects. Oh, you're those. <laughs> Why do you want those? I mean, maybe I do have some unlucky objects and I just don't know it, but, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of lucky things. Uh, I guess it, it started about 12, 13 years ago. I was in a taxi in Vegas and, um, the driver was like, all right, I owe you like $3 and change. And he goes, uh, oh, all I have is this $2 bill and then one single. So uh, uh, I'll give you the two. It's lucky. So, you know, hold on to it. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I had this thought, like, if anybody ever gives me something that's lucky, even though I'm supposed to be like a rational poker player that doesn't believe that luck exists one way or the other, like, what if it does? So from that point on, I, I decided that if anybody ever gives me something that they say is lucky, I'm going to hold on to it. And I still have that $2 bill. It's, it's in, you know, a box in my apartment with all the other things that uh, people have given me over the years that they say is lucky. Because, I mean, if you play enough poker or you meet enough people and you tell them you're a poker player, they're like, oh, here's something lucky. Hold on to this. Um, and I just had a taxi... I, I just I had a taxi driver the other day at the, in the Bahamas who he introduces, I get in the taxi and he's like, Hey, I'm Mr. Lucky. And I'm like, wait, Ooh. some people call me Mr. Lucky, you know, are we going to have a Mr. Lucky battle here? And we just started joking around on the way to the restaurant. And, uh, I had him wait for me because I, it was a very short dinner break and I was just meeting my family at this restaurant. So he waited for me at the restaurant. And then 30 minutes later, I come out to have him take me back to Baja Mar. And he hands me a bracelet, and he was like, hold on to this. This is Lucky. Um, you know, this is your, your bracelet from Mr. Lucky, and this will be your good luck charm from me. So that's another thing that's going to go into the box of, of Lucky things. Um, uh, so, yeah, I have a huge collection of things that over the years people have given me that, um, that they say are lucky. And I also have a chair from the Irish Open. Um, when there was 24 players left in the tournament, we had a redraw. And I get moved to the chair that the chip leader uh, had been sitting in. And as I sit down with my rack of chips, the chip leader points at my chair and he goes, hey, that's, that's the lucky chair. Look at all these chips I got while sitting in this chair over the last few hours. And I was like, what are you doing, man? Like, you could have just grabbed the chair and moved it into your new seat and then put the seat that you're currently sitting in here where I would have been sitting in and you could have kept the lucky chair. So I was just like kind of, you know, berating him for letting me sit in the chair. And then from that point on in the tournament, I always kept that chair with me. Even when we um, racked or when we bagged up chips for the final table, I put a roll of tape around the chair so that I could identify the chair and then put it behind a curtain so that no one would find it. And then I showed up a few minutes early for the final table and pulled the chair out from behind the curtain and then used the lucky chair of the entire final table, won the tournament. And then after the tournament was over, I asked the tournament director, I was like, is it okay if I keep the chair? Like, I want to have the lucky chair. In to bring the chair. And hold on, like I'll, like this is, this is the lucky Irish open chair. You can even see the tape is still the there. On them. And this just sits in my, my bedroom here. Look at all, these, all these fish never grabbed that chair. Can you believe yeah. it? Yeah, That's what's really crazy is no one grabbed that chair. And that, that guy ended up finishing second. Like, imagine if he had just kept that chair and not given That's it to so me. That's weird, actually. He, Both he, you guys finished first and second? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the that actually guys, is really cool. Huh? The two guys that used that lucky chair from day four onward finished first and second. What the? Uh, f that's actually a bizarre coincidence when you think about it. But yeah. that the chances of that happening are outrageously low. I mean, that makes you kind of want to believe. Um, do you have any other stories like that? Um. Well, I, yeah, I mean, not like that really. But uh, one other kind of amusing one was um, maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, I was at EPT Prague and they have the big, it's always in December and they have the big Christmas market in Prague. 
and uh, me and like I think Sam Greenwood was with us and JC Alvarado and maybe one or two other people were wandering around the Christmas market and I notice uh, one of the guys who's selling like random gifts um, like little trinkets and things he had this basket of these like little wicker owls and I love owls and I see that the sign on the front of the basket says lucky owls and so oh. I immediately walk up to him like hey buddy like are these owls lucky and he goes oh Steve O'Dwyer <laughs> And he just like was like a poker fan who recognized me. He was like, "Yes, like these these are these are lucky owls." Like, <laughs> and so I bought the entire basket from him, um, <laughs> and was giving them out to like all my friends. Like, you know, like here you got to have a lucky owl too. Um, and uh, yeah, then uh, I, I tweeted about it, and. Uh, I was like, hey, look, this, this fan of mine was out here selling Lucky Owls, and now I bought all of them, and I'm only giving them to my friends. And uh, the guy who sold them to me found the tweet and was, like, replying to it, and I was like, oh, let me, let me check out this guy's profile. And uh, I clicked on his Twitter profile, and it seemed like the only thing he tweeted about was, like, uh, his, like, favorite porno. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this, this guy's weird. Um <laughs> he's just like one of those guys that only tweets tweets links to his favorite porn videos um so yeah and i've been very lucky since buying those owls like i went on a big mm. upswing after that so well why why not thanks to the I, I, guy. um all right well i have uh a similar sorts of stories but i don't know if they're they're really there's uh, I, I guess I have a couple stories. I have a few. Um, I mean, obviously the main event one, or the 50k one, is, is my main story, mm -hmm. uh, where I just declared it was destiny. That I was going to win the thing, and then I won it two times in a row. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know if this stuff is real, but. Why not be open to it being real? It's a positive. Yeah, exactly. Real. Like I'm, I'm still not completely sold that that luck is a real thing and it matters. But what if it does? Uh, you know, like when I was in Japan last summer, like I had my buddy who was uh, the one who invited me out to Japan to play his poker tournaments. He was like, we had a free day, and he rented a van and it was like, I'll take you anywhere in Osaka you want to you want to go. And I was like, all right what do people in Osaka do when they want to improve their luck? So we went to two different temples in Osaka. Uh, one of them, like, there was, like, this kind of rock garden where you reach through the fence and you mm. grab a, a handful of stones and you have to find, like, the stones have, um, some of the stones have, like, different Japanese characters painted on them. And yeah. you have to find the three lucky stones in this rock garden. You know, you just take a big fistful of stones and, and look through each one to try to find the three different characters. And then you put them in a little lucky bag and then uh, like a, a priest at the temple like seals them up and then you get your, your bag of lucky stones. So we did that. And then we went to another temple like up on the mountain outside of the city um, where it's like they have these little painted, uh, they're called Daruma, these little painted dolls. Um, and you buy one when you're there and then when you're luck, when you, you buy one and then you think of what you want to have happen in your life. And then if that happens, you, uh, it only has one eye painted. And then once that your grant, your wish has been granted, then you paint the other eye and then bring it back to the temple. So this temple is like everywhere you look, it's this enormous property. And everywhere you look, there's these little painted dolls all over the property um, of people's really? wishes that have been granted. Um, like this, this is uh, this sounds. I mean, it sounds like kind of fun. I mean, like the stuff yeah. is at least fun. Like even if it doesn't necessarily work, I don't know because and like it, there's apparently it, such a thing. Huh? I was just gonna say it's also very entertaining to talk about it at the table, especially mm -hmm. with like some really rational guys, like you know some of these Germans. Nice to constantly be berating them for the unlucky things that they're doing. Uh, it's fun. 
you know, some oh, of these guys are, are way yeah. too rational and you can really kind of tilt them if you never stop talking about what they're doing is unlucky and how they need to be more like you so that they're luckier. <laughs> That's what I was saying to Chris Crook. I was telling him about how he's <laughs> the poker gods. He's not respecting the poker gods. And then for a while, he's running pretty bad. Uh, Lyle Berman also did this, like, very sneaky trick. He got us all these, like, pretty turkeys. But apparently turkeys are bad luck because the turkeys are, like, brought up to get slaughtered. So it's like, okay, we're getting, getting rid of this turkey. Like, I'm not even winning with it. Um, apparently it's the peacock feathers that are, that are lucky. There's many cultures uh, for some reason. Um... Yeah. I, I have some trinkets, but I don't know if they're exactly lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got one on me. Uh, I also had one, but I lost it. I had this bracelet. I actually visited the place where uh, where Christ was baptized in okay. the uh, river. Um, mm -hmm. that, was a bit of, I, that was a bit of an accident, actually. Uh, and uh, my friends and I washed our hands in the Jordan River, and I had like a little bracelet that I'd been in the river of uh, Jesus in case okay. there's like some power going on, but I yeah. don't have that on currently. This one um, is a, it's a, a very, uh, it's the most famous symbol in Hindu culture. Okay. I guess you can't, you can't really see it. It's the uh, Sri Yantra, but it's, oh. uh, it's, it's supposed to represent the evolution of the universe and be the most powerful uh, medallion or symbol in the universe. And it's supposed to represent fractals actually. Um, it turns out that much, much aspects of Hindu culture appear to have some relevancy to uh, mathematics and science, although I don't know enough to really say. But anyway, allegedly, if you meditate on this, all your dreams come true. No big nice. deal. I'm going to need to get one of those. Yeah, maybe I'll get some. Be some of the Another thing work. I've been planning on doing, but I haven't gotten around to yet, is I found this, like... Uh, this group that does like auctions of ancient artifacts in, in London actually. And, yeah. uh, you know, some of the, some of the things that they auction off, like go for like low prices, like, you know, 200 pounds or something. And I want to, like, it seems like it's kind of a, a bit of a classy, classy auction. You know, it seems like everybody gets pretty dressed up for these things, but then they have all sorts of like experts uh, there that you can go and speak to before the auction begins and ask them questions about the different lots that are up for auction. And I want to go there one time uh, and just go around asking all the experts, like, what what items here up for auction are things that the ancient people thought were lucky? Like, you know, speak to a, a ancient Egyptian expert and be like, do you have any, uh, like, scarabs, I believe, is what the... Uh, ancient Egyptians Ooh. thought were lucky and try to buy yeah. some lucky lucky thing that some ancient Egyptian was carrying around with them or some something that some ancient Greek person was, was carrying around. Like I did find um, it was like a, an ancient Roman ring that had been uh, auctioned off at the last um, auction like a few months ago. And I, I think it said it had some sort of name on it, but it was like a name that the Romans considered lucky. And it, it went for like a hundred pounds or something. But like, I'd love to have some ancient Roman ring that, that some guy 2000 years ago was wearing because he thought it was lucky, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that has like a certain kind of special value. And I guess like the thing about those things is that those the value in those things can actually skyrocket. Like it could like, one day be worth like a hundred thousand dollars if it like there's just like more history to it potentially as well. Like yeah, I guess maybe. it could be even like an investment of sorts. Um, and then you'll feel like an idiot when it goes for like ten million dollars. You're like, fuck! <laughs> I should have kept the lucky ring. <laughs> well, no, I mean, once I buy it, I'm keeping the lucky ring. I'm not going to resell it. You know, I'm not selling it for even ten million. Eh, maybe, but yeah, I, mean, I guess with ten million, I could buy a lot more lucky things. That's um, true. Um, by the, uh, the power of this, of this thing, by the way, is the power of evolution. So, you know, it's supposed to represent evolution. Um, that's why it's the evolution of the universe. It's supposed to be symbolic of that. Yeah. And it looks good too. You know, even if it doesn't work for luck aspects, you know, it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty necklace on its own. There's a monk that, um, I looked up his name. 
uh, there's a monk uh, that he put an end to a lot of injustice in the Vietnam War. He reminded mm -hmm. me of him because I actually I just watched a video the other day about him, and uh, he he burned himself alive. His name was Thick Quang Duc, something like okay. this. Okay, yeah, I think I know who you're talking about. And as it happens, there uh, was a he. His heart remained intact, like his heart's still there, but the rest mm -hmm. of him burned, which is a bizarre. Like I read that and I was like, okay, this story actually got crazier. Like, why didn't his heart, like, maybe there's some science behind it. I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but apparently it's a symbol of his compassion. So I guess that could be a lucky uh, a thing. Although I don't know if you want to like have something like that on you. But you reminded yeah. me, the trinkets yeah. reminded me of that one. Okay. Yeah, those are too great. Um, but uh, yeah, stuff like that seems especially, especially uh, uh, magical, holy, or whatever. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into this. I'm gonna see if I can find some magic trinkets. Like no one, no poker players explored. Yeah. This, this yeah, and you, of... you travel a lot. Like you know, it it doesn't. There's there's no harm in asking. You know, uh, whoever your local host is in a country, you know, ask them like, what do you guys do if you think you need to improve your luck a bit? Like, what foods do you eat? Where do you go to pray? You know, what things do you buy? Stuff like that, you know, it's fun. Oh yeah, I should, I'd probably yeah, you, appreciate you're it. You're a very well-traveled guy, you know, when you're in Guatemala, ask ask a local, like. Oh, I'm doing it. Guatemala guys, is gonna be an expedition. What do you guys think about luck and how do you improve your luck? I want to do that. I'm going, to, I'm going to a mystic place, man. I'm going to no joke a mystic place. I'm going yeah. to this place that's like studied ancient hermeticism and uh, like, you know, going to be learning their practices a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, hmm? Just embrace it. It's, it's fun. At, at the very least, it's fun to think whatever you're doing is, is making you luckier. And I'm sure yeah. it'll annoy the hell out of Kruk. If you if you show back up <laughs> at Bobby's room and all you talk about is uh, how Guatemala made you a lot luckier. <laughs> well, I might have. I've been losing a lot in Bobby's room lately, so I might as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one last question. Yeah. Uh, what would be the... Well, actually, I want to ask you this. What would be the... Uh, what's the hardest lesson you ever learned? Um... I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. Um, maybe just that, uh, I guess I came to the realization maybe like 12 years ago that, uh, that you really need to play a lot of poker to like uh, beat out variants. I kind of thought like, you know, I don't really need to play that much. Like eventually I'm just going to start winning some tournaments and uh, I'll be good. But then once I started really realizing like how much variance there is, I was like, Oh my God, like I'm lazy. Like I need to play way more poker. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's not that hard of a lesson, but it was uh, a bit of an eye opener. I think it, it must've been Ike who was like, uh, yeah, variance Variance is way bigger than you seem to believe it is. Like, you got to play a yeah. lot more. Um, and I Would was you like, say oh, it's 1.7 times bigger than what you think it is? It, probably, uh, at least. Uh, I probably... It was probably, for me, for what I thought it was, it was probably like 10x bigger. Um, oh, really? Well, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't really... I mean, I played a bit. I thought I was playing a lot of poker, but it turned out I was not really playing that much. I was quite lazy. It turns out that um, I, I wondered if it would have been one point seven. Maybe it's not, but definitely people have a tendency to underestimate how complicated things are. Mm -hmm. But uh, the biggest one, uh, the reference of one point seven, comes from the planning fallacy, which um, which is it's very common. I've seen it over and over in myself. Is that everything takes one point seven times more longer than what you think it is? That's the average amount of time that things take. I would say that that's probably like a good estimate for a lot of things. I mean, poker is a bit different because it's easy to be deluded in poker and it, it raises yeah. your awareness yeah. of that. Um, I do. I did. I was remembered, 
I was reminded of something else, actually. Is that a, you had an unlucky Luxon hat, if I uh, <laughs> yeah. understood correctly. <laughs> it doesn't make sense that that hat, like, could be unlucky, but I don't know much about Luxon. But I just interpret it to be like, you know, some like in um, like something that is just about uh, is I just interpret it to be something like that just has no relevancy, has not much soul to it, if that makes sense. Things that are soulless tend to be, I would think that they tend to be unlucky. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it was just it was just kind of a funny thing that happened. Like me and Mike Watson had late registered this tournament, and we sat down at the same exact time at the same table, and there was this guy uh, at our table who was wearing a Luxon hat, and he had a lot of chips, and Mike Watson was like, "Oh, you you're wearing the Luxon hat. Those are those are lucky." Like I had been wearing one for a few months prior to this trip, and I'm on a huge upswing. Uh, and I was like, oh, no one told me that these Luxon hats are lucky. And Mike Watson was like, yeah, Luxon, it turns your luck on. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. So I immediately grabbed my phone and sent a message to uh, the VIP host for Luxon that was at uh, the PCA. And I was like, hey, get me one of those hats. But I didn't tell anybody at my table, like, hey, I'm, I'm getting one of these hats sent over to me right away. <laughs> and in the 10 minutes it took for the hat to arrive, I ran up a pretty big stack. Like I, I had almost doubled my stack in like four hands. And then I'm in the middle of another pot and she shows up and puts the hat on my head and the whole table like burst out laughing. They were like, how did you do that? Like how did <laughs> like 10 minutes after this conversation, like all of a sudden someone shows up and puts a Luxon hat on you. Um, and I was just like, yeah, it's great, great customer service from Luxon. But then from that point on, I did not win a single hand the rest of the tournament and bust that bullet and another bullet. So clearly, get rid of, that thing. Get rid of the hat. Like, you know, lost $20,000 wearing that hat. It works for the uh, people of Luxon. We have the Luxon yeah. cult device. But it was also um, a good way to, for me to, you know, trash talk Lufthansa being like, look, I can't get my bags back. I can't get a response out of you guys in 10 days. But 10 minutes after asking looks on for a lucky hat it was just plopped on my head well, we're going to talk about the fans a little bit more in a second i just want to mention okay. also some trustees of some companions of mine did bring a magic conch shell to me when i was in trident when i needed it and i blew the magic conch. <laughs> I, I think i saw that <laughs> the one in cyprus quality. right yeah yeah uh, in Cyprus, I got uh, quad eights against like top flops or something for 500k, <laughs> something like completely outrageous thing. Yeah, I don't um, think I talked to you that trip, but I, I loved your outfit. That was uh, the great look you had going. No, thank you. Um, I think there, Tridan may may return. He was defeated, but uh, something tells are me you gonna, Tridan. Are you going to come to Vietnam? I think so. Yes. Nice. I'm very excited about that trip. Uh, the resort looks amazing. And Triton events are just the absolute best. Like, so you, comfortable to play. I do agree. But do you know of any Mrs. Lucky places or Lucky... Uh, I don't know, uh, but we should, we should ask, uh, see if Kate can do some research for us and uh, maybe organize a luck, luck pilgrimage in Hoi An before the events start. <laughs> I would I would totally go do a little luck pilgrimage with Jungle Man. That sounds like a, right. a fun fun afternoon activity. All right, we'll go on a luck pilgrimage and we'll find the lucky trinkets and mystic uh, things. I looked a little bit actually. There's a uh, I researched a little. And I found like there's like secret seances that exist between uh, related to this like religion that's a little bit off of. Uh, uh, off of like Buddhism or something called Taoism, uh, Taoism, mm. something like that. Okay. And when the the government basically banned the seance, <laughs> um, uh, which I, that seems really crazy to me because like, like do they actually work? It's but apparently it's these readings from these certain people that I guess uh, 
God speaks to. Or, like, I don't even know how it works. I mean, they um, might be but, doing some scamming. That Maybe that's why they're banned. But uh, Yeah, that could be the case, too. They could just be straight up bad. But um, yeah, Hoi An, where the Triton is, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a super old, really? old city. Um, I'm oh, sure really? they've got some, some lucky beliefs that we could take advantage of. They've got to have some, some, some mystic shit going on there, for sure. All right, well, we'll keep that in mind. All right, guys. So we want to go over some advice for tournament players, some uh, some practical advice and some mystic advice of sorts. Steve, when you're all in in a tournament, what do you want to be thinking of? Well, if you're ahead, you don't want to ever ask out loud for what cards the dealer puts out on the board. Like you just stay, if you're already ahead, you just stay silent. And if you must think about what the cards are, you want the cards to come out on the board that are the lowest possible cards that do not change the, the board or the, the two hands in any way. So if you have aces against queens all in on a uh, 10, 5, 3 board, you in your mind should be thinking uh, just offsuit deuce. Because that doesn't change anything. You're already ahead. You don't need an ace. You don't need to improve her in, in any way. And then, you know, if the deuce comes, then you just think, like, oh, offsuit four. Because that's the next lowest card that doesn't change anything. You don't want another deuce to come because that actually gives you two pair. You don't need two pair. Because <laughs> if, if you start thinking, like, if there's a deuce already on the board and you start thinking deuce, like, that's getting greedy. You don't need two pair. Like, that makes it more likely that the queen's going to come and, and bust you. All right, um, and also stay in your chair because you're already ahead. And if you're confident you're going to win the hand, uh, you want to be in your chair for the next hand. So just stay in your chair. A lot of people think standing up and packing up your things early is, is lucky. But um, I've been observing this for 15 years. I have a spreadsheet that I update. He's got the data, guy. I observe it all. Yeah, I'm, I've got the data. Trust me, it's unlucky. Um, just stay in your chair. You're going to win more often. It doesn't work always. Uh, but it, it makes you more lucky. All right. I think, uh, I do think, I have the suspicion that positive, being having a positive uh, mindset and being a positive source of, uh, <laughs> it can totally make this up. But I have, it seemed like it's true. I was like really angry and whatever the other day and I lost. Um, mm -hmm. And I was in the wrong, as I real, uh, it turned out. No, I was in the wrong. I did a couple bad things. Uh, I always lose when I do bad things. It always like f me somehow. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't that bad. It was just like a little bit bad. But anyway, um, the Poker Gods team did minus 240k bad. Anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does appear that having a positive... Uh, being a source of positivity for the rest of the table and giving in that kind of sense emotionally, actually, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like that's some kind of run good. Can't prove it. Uh... But I've noticed something like that going on. And yeah. Who knows if that's true or not, but it's a positive free roll. Yeah. Um, if, if you've got some negative energy about you, a negative aura, I feel like you definitely do uh, tend to do worse than uh, your poker skill might indi indicate. Tell us again about Lufthansa and what they've yeah. done to you. Don't ever fly with Lufthansa if anything goes wrong and they lose your bags, even if you know where your bags are, they will do absolutely nothing to return them to you. So trust me when I say this, just fly with any other airline. You're better off. Um, even today, uh, one of the Bulgarian pros, uh, Dimitar Danchev, tweeted at me saying, Lufthansa canceled my flight with uh, no, no warning and uh, they're not being responsive and uh, I should have listened to Steve, you know. Just, just don't do it. Listen to me. Fly with somebody else. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. Lapanza doesn't give a shit about you. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time, Steve. I've got to yeah, go. You. I had a great time. Yeah, and appreciate the opportunity to share some light on the uh, on the world of Steve O'Dwyer and uh, Bluff Panther Justin. Thank you.